and economics. She's also USDA's chief scientist. The REE mission area is comprised of more than 8,500 employees with a $4 billion budget across its five component areas. And so that includes ARS, um, the Economic Research Service, the National Agricultural Statistical Service, um, the National Institute of Food and Agriculture, and the Office of the Chief Scientist. Together, these organizations advance agricultural research, innovation, data, and extension across a full range of agricultural issues, including climate smart agriculture, nutrition security, equity, and strengthening the food supply chains. As chief scientist, Dr. Jacobs Young advises the Secretary of Agriculture and other senior officials on scientific matters and chairs the USDA Science Council, which convenes all parts of USDA's scientific enterprise. Prior to being appointed by President Biden to serve as REE Undersecretary, Dr. Jacobs Young was administrator for ARS from 2014 to 2022. Prior to that role, she serves as ARS Associate Administrator for National Programs, leading the research objectives of the entire agency. Dr. Jacobs Young is a proud native of Georgia. She holds an MS and PhD degree in wood and paper science and a bachelor's of science degree in pulp and paper science and technology from North Carolina State University. So I would like to welcome to the podium, Dr. Shavonda Jacobs Young. Thank you, Dr. Chester, and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to what we consider a very exciting session and a culmination of a lot of work that has occurred over the past year. Um, I believe that it has been a long time coming. And I'm so excited that you have decided to join us today, knowing that there are many competing opportunities across this entire conference. So I'm just going to give a, just a short background and then get right to the discussion with our panelists, which is the most exciting part. So last year at USDA, we launched the Agricultural Science Center of Excellence in Nutrition and Diet for Better Health, Ascend for Better Health, spurred on by President Biden's Bold Cancer Moonshot 2.0, which is a coordinated push across government to end cancer as we know it. I and Secretary Vilsack had the honor of understanding how vital this role is that of agriculture that we launched a sin late last year. We know that food and nutrition can play an important part in addressing diseases and chronic health issues. The idea behind ASCEND is that by creating flexible structure for coordination, synchronization, and cooperation, it will inject new life into our understanding of the capacity of food to defeat cancer. So over the past year, we've held some listening sessions across the country with the African-American community in Louisiana, uh, the Hispanic community in Laredo, Texas, a tribal community in Bismarck, North Dakota, and a youth community with our partnership with 4-H across the nation. We know that different parts of our population can have different nutri nutrient needs, different traditions, and different contexts that make their optimal diets unique. So the idea was to meet communities where they are and learn about their lived experiences with food. And I suppose I can take a quick step back here just to let you know a little bit about me and why I take this so personally. And so just to give you some insight on why I'm so passionate about this topic, I have firsthand knowledge about the experiences that drive uh, me to pursue nutrition and healthy eating for better life with a passion. I grew up right here, as Dr. Chester said, in Georgia, uh, about two hours up I-20 to, uh, uh, to Augusta, Georgia, here from Atlanta. And we know that there are many parts of the South that have some of the highest levels of obesity. We know that the rates of obesity don't impact just adults, but also children, in, indeed. And we know that the lack of healthy choices can lead to disease and premature death. And I understand the socioeconomic and cultural issues surrounding food choices in the South. 
you know, food brings us all together. It is a common language spoken by many of us. And my family's been troubled with heart disease, diabetes, kidney disease, hypertension, and yes, cancer. My father died when he was 51. My grandfather and grandmother on my mother's side died in their 50s. My dad's mother died before I was born. And my mom's sister and brothers died in their 50s. And my sister died recently at age 50. So as jarring as this may seem, it's been my personal experience. And unfortunately, it may be some of the personal experience of those who are in the room today and listening to us online. And so as we travel the country, talking with communities about their challenges with nutrition and healthy lifestyle, I learned it resonated across the country, across communities. What we learned across all communities is that lifestyle factors, knowledge, lack of initiative, discipline, and health issues are the main reason that people identify for struggling to improve their health through nutrition. We learned that our social environments and cultural influences are important in our food choices. And, we so, and so we conclude that the path to improve health through nutrition and diet may vary. Well, we know it varies. <laughs> and that we need to meet people where they are that through people you know and trust and with knowledge that is tailored to the specific communities. We announced the first pilot nutrition hub just over a month ago, targeted especially for the African-American community. This is the first of many efforts underway. This partnership between USDA and Southern University will strive to stretch to search out, not stretch out, we hope we don't stretch all the resources, but we're gonna search out, digest and reformat information from the best and latest science into pieces, digestible pieces of information that people can use. So that's a bit of a background on a sand for better health and USDA's first nutrition hub. And so now let's meet these wonderful panelists, the fabulous people who've joined us here today and who all took part in our SIN community engagements, our community conversations over the past 10 months and talk with them about their reflections on these events and the data and stories we gathered from their communities. So panelists, I'm going to briefly introduce you then I want you to tell us which community conversation you attended and your role there, and then other tidbits about yourselves um, that you might wanna share at this time. So first, Mr. Sky Hopper is a first-generation student pursuing a bachelor's degree at Drexel University in chemistry with the biochemistry concentration. So just a light load there, Sky. You might wanna <laughs> bring that up with biology and interdisciplinary problem solving as a minor. He is the oldest of six boys and comes from the Navajo Nation. Sky has previously worked for USDA labs in Beltsville, Maryland, and in Winmore, Pennsylvania. He is also the founder and president of Drexel Indigenous Students of the Americas and an avid DEI advocate. He is an active member of ACES, American Indian Science and Engineering Society, and is a Goldwater, Udall, and Truman Scholar. Welcome, Mr. Harper. It's good to see you again. Tell us which conversation you've been a part of and anything else that you may want to add um, by way of introduction to yourself. Everyone, I attended the North Dakota, um, Bismarck, North Dakota, listening session, the tribal community out there. Um, and what was what else was that? Anything else you like to share with us? Yeah, about yourself. Oh, uh, yeah. I um. So, kind of in my introduction, I come from the Nation, which is located in the Four Corners area in Arizona. But what I've noticed is that going to the listing session in North Dakota, there was a lot of um, parallels I could draw from my own community to then. And I'll speak more on that later. But I think that was just one of the more insightful things from this experience. Fantastic. Thank you, Mr. Harper. Now, Badidi, Badidi, Bidiriana. Bidiriana. Yes. And I have this written down phonetically, so I can't even read my own <laughs> writing. Badidiana Vila, MSNRNVA-BC. My goodness. A clinical assistant professor at the Texas A&M International University. Ms. Vila has been part of the healthcare industry for 18 years. Were you two when you started? 
Her first Thank role you. was as a radio radiological technologist. Years later, she became a registered nurse with a focus on critical care nursing. Then she returned to school for a master's degree in nursing administration. Her research interest is mainly in vascular access and infection prevention. She shared with us that she is the first generation to be born in the United States in her family and the first to obtain a master's level education. Welcome, Ms. Vila. Tell us which conversation you've been a part of and the huge role you and your students um, had there, then anything else that you may want to add by way of introduction. Well, thank you for the introduction. Um, uh, we were a part of the um, listening sessions in Laredo, Texas. I am a professor in Texas A&M International University, which is part of the Texas A&M system, which is really involved in Ascent for Better Help. Um, we were called in to volunteer as um, table moderators for this listening session. So my students were pretty much frustrated that we were volunteered at the beginning. And um, as we were presented to the event, the, they were very excited. They became 100% engaged in the sessions. And because of our community, it's 90% uh, Spanish speaking and the crowd that we were serving in the event was in the older on the older age gap. Um, they were instrumental to the to this to these listening sessions to be able to translate and get these results that that we got from from the event. And they were so impressive. I wish we had the cop a copy of the picture that we were I, all I able to take. Oh my phone, but we'll see. Yes, yes, it was. It, they were wonderful. Thank you. They so were much. wonderful, even if it started off all and told. But they at the very end, much, they very much, you know, definitely. bought in. And at the end, they were very fulfilled with the experience because yeah. it's it's about linking, you know, research with education and helping uh, the underserved communities and finding out what, what is there to, to do for them. So they were very fulfilled and very proud that they were able to, to help the community and to help with this project that is amazing. We loved it. We loved it. So thank you, Ms. Vila. On to Mr. Joshua B. McDonald, MPA, Nutrition Education Programs Coordinator, SNAP-Ed and FNIP Director at the Southern University Agriculture Research and Extension Center. Mr. McDonald is a native of Albany, Georgia. I said that right? Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> he obtained his bachelor's degree in political science from Bethune-Cookman University in 2012 and his master's degree, this MPA in public administration from Southern University and A&M College in 2018. Mr. McDonald began employment with the Southern University Agriculture Research and Extension Center's Cooperative Extension Program in 2019 as the field coordinator of the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program Education, SNAP-Ed. In 2021, he was promoted to the Nutrition Education Program Coordinator as the Program Director of the SNAP-Ed Program in the Expanded Food and Nutrition Education Programs, FNIP, which most of us know it as FNIP. In addition to working with the nutrition education programs, Mr. McDonald works closely with the Southern University Ag Center of Excellence, which is a great partner to NIFA, our National Institute of Food and Agriculture. Mr. McDonald has become a member of several prestigious professional organizations, such as the Association of Extension Administrators, the Society of Nutrition Education and Behavior, and the 1890 Extension Leadership Academy. So welcome, Mr. McDonald. Tell us about your role in our community conversations and anything else that you would like to add as a way of introduction. Uh, thank you so much for that introduction, first and foremost. Uh, welcome, everybody, and thank you so much for having us all. As mentioned, my name is Joshua McDonald, uh, and I attended the listener session at the Great Southern University. Uh, my role in that listening session was, uh, in addition to being a table moderator, we also were able to host additional tables uh, that show other programs and resources that we have that can help leverage the Ascend initiative uh, at Southern University. So uh, through that partnership and our continuous efforts of collaboration, we hope to really bring this initiative to light uh, and to share with our communities. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. That was a very exciting um, community engagement as well. We had the, our members from the senior citizens facility who did not hold any any thoughts. <laughs> they shared openly and often, and it was, was a very lively conversation. So last but not least, Ms. Andrea Masonette Sanchez, a plant pathology intern, USDA ARS Fargo, North Dakota. I want you to keep that in mind when I tell you a little bit more about her introduction. 
Miss Masonette Sanchez is a Puerto Rico 4-H youth leader. Now, I, we're going to talk about how you ended up in Fargo. <laughs> Since 2016, Andrea has been working in 4-H with environmental projects in the United States Forest Service National Rainforest, El Yunca. Did I get that right? El Yunca, yeah. El Yunca, <laughs> and Northwest Protected Coastal Zone. While pursuing a bachelor's degree in microbiology, simultaneously worked as an undergraduate research assistant under a USDA NIFA HSI BIO grant. Her research proposal is titled Impact of Organic Fertilizers, Heavy Metal Content on Soil Microbiota, Biota, Microbiota, and Plant Germination. Findings contributed to the fields of environmental microbiology and toxicology aligned with agricultural science and public health. So is that all? <laughs> all right. She has been part of the honors program, president of the microbiology chapter affiliated to the American Society of Microbiology and member of the Society of Toxicology. <laughs> In 2019, she served as a youth advisor at the National 4-H Congress, Congress in Atlanta, Georgia, 4-H, which has been an essential part of her personal development and career. So welcome, Ms. Mason at Sanchez. Please add to, you know, my brief introduction, just <laughs> what, in, what conversation were you a part of and anything you'd like to share with part of your introduction? Hi, everyone. Like she said, my name is Andrea Mason. It's very interesting how I get to Fargo, but that's another topic <laughs> to discuss, but I'm excited to be here and how I got to work with the Center for Better Health. I got to be participate for the second year um, in the National 4-H Conference at Washington, D.C. as a roundtable facilitator um, working with the topic Center for Better Health. Um, this is very important for, for me and for the topic to bring perspective from different delegates from around the United States. and um, territories. I come from Puerto Rico, as I, as I mentioned and she mentioned. Um, so for me, being an underrepresented community woman and Latina, it's very important for me to encourage diversity and inclusivity under this topic. So working with delegates around the United States with this topic is such an important thing to bring perspective and move forward into a sense for better health. So Absolutely. Thank you for being here. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. And so for our first question, panelists, I'll ask each of you, what, what stands out to you from the community conversations that you attended? Perhaps you remember a particular challenge that surfaced or an ideal opportunity that was discussed. So let's start with you, uh, Ms. Masonette Sanchez. <laughs> so bringing up um, this perspective and this, um, we got a question from the um, representatives of the Ascent for Better Health. Um, so bringing this question to the delegates, um, it was important for them to, for me, to make them, um, and also for them to understand what the agency wanted from them and how can they bring their own perspectives um, into the topic. Um, some of the things that they mentioned um, was um, the resources that they gain and how they can know about the topic. Um, I don't know if any of you guys have ever been into the USDA website. Um, it's very hard to navigate. And some of the, th of the things that we mentioned was that, and also um, representation about, um, okay, how can I in my community understand what is happening if I don't have the resources or the knowledge or I can't navigate the topic? So we, we brought those things, um, also legislation, also mental health was, in a, was an important topic to understand health and everything that comes with that. Absolutely, thank you. Mr. Harbour. Yeah, so from the session that I attended, um, I think I had the unique experience of being there as both a member of the community, of a tribal community, and at the same time being there to facilitate a conversation in a table. Um, and what stood out the most was just going into the um, into our table discussion. Time and time again, it came up that some of the biggest challenges that they face, that we face as Indigenous people with regards to food security and nutrition, is 
is all, um, it all, I guess, originates from colonization. They're still facing effects of colonization. And everybody expressed like, yes, we do have cultural teachings. We have cultural traditions that are meant to keep us healthy. However, because of colonization, we've lost a lot of our ways and a lot of um, that knowledge. So um, I think now a lot of people are kind of talking about more revitalization of that culture, looking at indigenous recipes, trying to restore those practices. I know um, some of the things they were talking about were going um, going out for recreational hunting and gathering. That's one thing that they wanted to um, emphasize and kind of get help with, as well as maybe more knowledge with how to cook traditional foods. So for me, I think that was kind of the thing that stood out the most, just really seeing how tied um, our Indigenous people are to their culture and how we, we really did have these different um, practices and teachings already. Um, and along with that, even just some um, Number, even outside of just preparing and cooking food, it was also um, the remoteness of the area. A lot of people um, live outside of the immediate community, more in these rural areas. And that's something that we face in my own, own home community. So there's a lot of factors that contribute to, um, to these disparities, but kind of from my own home community, like they were mirrored in, the, in North Dakota. Yeah, I, I remember at that community engagement, it started off really quiet, yeah. it, you know, so you, me also learning the different cultures, it started off really, really quiet. But by the end, like, like in Laredo, folks were talking and sharing and I, it, but it was, it was just like, I got so nervous. I was like, oh my gosh, it's so quiet. And I think it was the first time I was introduced to the importance of hunting and foraging, yeah. you know, as a, as a critical part of the food system. And I think the other thing too is like, um, I feel like everybody was kind of hesitant at the beginning just because they, the whole idea of colonization and then yeah. the government and just the mistrust. I know, I know. Mm -hmm. Like I, I, I understand where they were coming from. Yeah, well. absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. And it's, I think it was the first time I heard about the role of food banks and sometimes getting foods that, first of all, we don't know what it is, let alone how to prepare it. And so it was a gentleman who shared that. I go, ha, huh, yep, yep, I can see that. I can see that. Well, thank you, Mr. Hopper. Mr. McDonald. Uh, for our listening session at Southern University, I think there were two major points uh, that stood out for us collectively, uh, and that was inclusivity and accessibility. Uh, for inclusivity, we have to realize that although with my plate USDA uh, dietary guideline for Americans, there's so many suggestions, but they don't necessarily incorporate the cultural aspect of the individuals that they seek to actually aid. So we have to remember, uh, especially in our Southern Louisiana state, uh, we love Creole, we love Cajun, uh, and a lot of those things that we implement into our diets is what we grew up on is a cultural thing. So there is a way to keep that cultural aspect at the same time adding a, a healthier option or healthier substitutions that can make that meal better to digest and better overall for your health. Uh, and then the biggest of the two, I think, is definitely accessibility. Yeah. Realizing that even in our back door of Southern University, we have a food desert and there are food deserts prevalent throughout the city of Baton Rouge uh, and throughout the state of Louisiana. So it's how are we going to marginalize on those populations and provide them with the resources or the accessibility that they need in order to even bring on the challenge of accepting the initiative that Ascend for Better Health has. So those were the two big takeaways for Southern University, accessibility and inclusivity. Yeah, that was our first one. You know, it's our first in-person one. And it was it was so much, I wouldn't say fun. It really was a lot of fun going out from out, away from the Zoom sort of community engagements and in-person. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember talking about things as simple as a serving size. You know, things that most of you in the audience know exactly what the serving size, you know, what it is, even if we don't use it, we know <laughs> where to look for it and how to implement it and how we can make small um, adjustments in some of those recipes and they can still taste good, right? Yes. So that was, it was a lot, it was a very enlightening. Um, and then the lack of grocery stores, I think is something that I heard across all the communities. Um, okay, Ms. Vila. All right, so in the collections of the data, there was definitely several things that the community brought up. You know, one is, the knowledge deficit of the relationship um, with nutrition and uh, chronic disease. 
you know, they say eat healthy, um, but they definitely don't know in depth that, you know, a poor diet will, you know, in the long run was, was going to be the factor that's going to develop the disease. So that's first, you know, first thing, because they go to their visits, uh, the, their doctor visits sporadically, but they don't listen to, and then uh, sometimes, or not sometimes, often and very oftentimes is the language barrier where they go and the physician or the practitioner does not have the proper translation uh, uh, ways to pass on the message to the, the, the visitor. So that's one thing. Another is accessibility. It's, it's, it's one thing, 20% uh, of the Laredo community uh, lives in poverty. And so that's one of the things that lack of transportation to get to those resources. Um, another, uh, thing is that they thought that some programs were a little bit restrictive of the, the criteria, but there was lack of knowledge as well. Because once they were brought up to the programs that are available locally, they were like, oh, you know, I am, uh, you know, I meet the criteria. So it's it's that link, accessibility with lack of, of, of the knowledge. And also there is a social dimension to it. Um, not only because uh, we were brought on in some way, the diet that we were, you know, we were brought on and, and raised, but also the way that we live, the time management, you know, life and work balance for, for those that, that work. Um, just do a quick meal, what we have, what a drive through has to provide for us, mm -hmm. um, getting that morning, you know, burrito, bacon and egg. Uh, and so it's a lot of the social you know, the social aspect as well. So it was a it was a very informative session and the crowd, like I mentioned before, was a little bit on the older gap. So their acts, you know, the way that they access their food is sometimes, you know, their their providers, the, the caregivers that take them something and they're not able to have a nutritious meal because that's all they had or that's what they have access to. Yeah, I, I remember learning that Laredo is a port so a lot of food comes into Laredo, but it passes right through. Mm -hmm. And that was just yes. shocking. You know, yes. that was a shocking, you know, revelation for me. Um, so that I know I, I forgot something. Okay. Opportunity that um that we did see on on that. So we have those COSDA funded programs mm -hmm. um locally. And just to expand for, you know, do an assessment of other communities that are in need and to expand those programs that could be helpful yeah. for maybe the elderly that they had more access to to those resources and those nutritious foods. Um, so that was an opportunity that we didn't you know, that I saw from there. Well, great. I'll share that in, at each one of these, we had a lot of representation from agencies with information about programs. Right. Once again, it's like, so what's out there? What might I be eligible for? Maybe, maybe I had some assumptions about it, but actually I am eligible for this. And so things like GUSNIP, the W dollars, um, when you buy fresh produce and vegetables. So now I know that each of you has had an opportunity to see the follow-up report with observations both across our communities and specific to each of the communities. Uh, were there any surprises for you in the report and findings, anything you know or have experienced that importantly might be missing? Um, start with you, Mr. McDonald. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so overall, I wouldn't say that there was anything that was shocking or surprising, but it was a wealth of information and knowledge that even we sometimes overlook or don't place enough value on. So for us, the value may be in the diet needs to change. We need to see a proportion plate. Uh, but the reality is, again, without resources or knowledgeability of everything that encompasses that healthy plate, uh, it's a gap between us relaying the information and the re information being received and being able to take it actually into implementation. So uh, I think it was a wealth of information that we just sometimes dim lights on, mm -hmm. but it refocused us and allowed us to regain strength in our initiative. Thank you, Ms. Vila. No, definitely. There there wasn't a surprise because as a nurse and I worked in the hospital for several years, you know, we know our community mm -hmm. and it's highly prevalent with heart disease, diabetes, um, and it's mostly related to diet. And so I wasn't surprised, but like, like Mr. Madonna says, it, it just gave us 
that statistical information that we can use to implement and start projects, start partnerships with other organizations. You know, personally, I would love to, to work um, with my students to be able to continue to help. So there, there, wasn't, there wasn't a surprise, really. Okay, thank you. Ms. Masonette Sanchez. Um, as, I don't think it was more of a surprise or if, if it's a surprise, I would say it's a positive way to see how the work that I've done and the work that other people have done is being assessed and change is not gonna happen from one day to another. There's hard work um, behind all the purpose of Ascent for Better Health, um, but it's very important that it is written in paper and put out there that the work that we all are doing and other people are doing is being understood, assessed, and what's the plan for the next thing and how can this is going to be implemented in our communities. So I feel like this is, it was not a surprise as, oh, wow, like as a negative thing, it was more as a positive that things are moving forward for the beneficial of everyone and the underrepresented communities and everyone in, involved in the Center for Better Health. Thank you. This is Harper. I have to reiterate that as I was looking through the report, there wasn't anything that shocked me or really surprised me. However, I guess looking from the outside in from a different perspective, I can see some things that people may not kind of think of at first. So I guess one of the things that really stood out to me was throughout the report, um, the data had said that all these individuals in the community, they cared about their health and they wanted to do better. But then the issues came again, where it was like, well, we have all these different things against us. And some of those were like, um, we live in a town, a rural town, we have to drive to the grocery store. Coming back home, we have these ingredients, but now we're hungry. So what are we going to do? Go to a convenience store, go to get fast food. So that's something that not everybody always thinks about, kind of like, well, you have these ingredients, you have to go home to cook them, but you have to go home first. Then along with that, people just, they, have, they wanted knowledge on how to read food labels. People didn't have that experience. They didn't have that knowledge. So there was kind of that barrier again, that was like, okay, how are we supposed to overcome that? So yeah, like what everybody was saying, there's nothing super shocking, but there were some things that I think I had to kind of step back and really think like, okay, without knowing my own community or knowing, I guess, this history, what would stand out. Right, absolutely. I, I think in some of the initial data, I was surprised about where people get their information from, mm -hmm. right? And, and sort of the age breakdown where they got their information. So you'll have to read the report to see that shocking revelation. Um, it, it, it was it was just shocking. It was surprising to me because I know as the chief scientist of USDA, we're constantly in competition with the Facebook philosophers, the Twitter <laughs> theologists, the, you know, theology, you know, it's just because we have all these voices. And so how do people know who they can listen to and who they can trust? Reliable. And could I add something mm -hmm. to that? Um, those that, that was one of the things we talked, um, the delegates talked in the when they were presenting their topic. Um, we have a lot of influence from the social media, and this is where the mental health comes involved because um, we are in a world, a present world, where people and youth have a time span of, of interest of three seconds. Mm -hmm. So it's easily to get influenced very easily because you have a phone, you have a computer where you can find any type of information in just a second. So that's why I mentioned the USDA platform because it's very important for the youth and the people to have the information, the real information, the reliable source. Mm -hmm. and, if the, and if the website is not updated or easy to navigate, people are gonna go and get their information from sources that are not necessarily the right ones. You know, We have a lot of diets in the internet that are maybe not healthy for everyone. And that's something that is a health issue, a public health issue, because you have all these people um, taking up on diets that they saw on the internet and changing them from like one day to another. And that's a health, a, a health issue. So it's important to be navigating the public health. And as they all mentioned, is the report is very wonderful. And like I said, it is surprisingly to see the work, but it, it has to be assessed and it has to be like done in a way like it's not from one day to another, but it's important to assess these issues because in a changing world that is so fast, 
then yeah. this issue has to be as, as as fast as we're going into the world, you know? I I so agree. And I think that's why it's important to, important to have, you know, partners in the communities like each of the each of the communities that you represented and participated in. Um, you know, when the government shows up and we're here to help, <laughs> yeah. not always received that way. And so that's why it's so wonderful to have partners like yourselves partner with us as we as we um do this work. So we have a public health audience here. This is my first time to APHA. I'm not sure about you guys, but you know, the opportunity to talk about food and nutrition and public health. So what is one take home message for this audience? One thing that you really want us to remember about what you've learned or about your community, maybe it's the best practice that you learned or can share with about your community with this audience. Let's start with uh, Mr. Harper. So looking at take home messages, there's there's definitely a lot, but um, to condense that as much as I can, I would say inform yourselves of the different communities. Not everybody has the same structure, not everybody. But sure, there are some things that mirror within communities, but they're not going to be the same, um, especially indigenous communities. I know like the indigenous population, we run into a lot of issues with people stereotyping, people not being informed. So especially in those types of communities, do some research, go look at whatever resources you can and make sure that they're factual to you as well. Yeah, right. One size doesn't fit all, right? All right, Miss Vila. I think, you know, piggybacking with that, um, same, you know, I believe that I came to represent South Texas because I wanted, you know, for public health people to kind of like look at it, uh, look at the population. And so, like I said, like, like others have said, is um, about the research on the specific uh, population and the specific groups, and not 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 only let's say Hispanic, but also the age group, because you have to consider that having social media involved and giving the proper diets, or you know having the U, let's say USDA Facebook page or the Instagram, if if anything, to um, give some healthy tips. And instead of them going and looking at those fat diets that could affect them in the in the long run. Absolutely, Mr. McDonald. Uh, my biggest takeaway, uh, I believe, would say USDA is doing this the right way. Uh, okay. In order for us to have a discussion about anyone, they have to be included in the conversation. Uh, and I think that this was one of the biggest uh, realizations that even we as programs of the Southern University Ag Center realized that we aren't engaging those stakeholders, who is the individuals that this is for, uh, enough. And bringing USDA in and allowing them to create those listening sessions and community conversations, we realized how much of an impact that that played even in our individual programs and how that data collected for this one thing can actually be used and mirrored in several different other initiatives that we have. So it showed us that the conversation has to start with the individuals yes. that we seek uh, to help improve health. At the table, at yes. the table for all of you uh, scientists and technical people in the room. It's like bringing a statistician on after you've finished the whole project. Right. I'm sure some of y'all got there, right? <laughs> <laughs> all right. Save me, Ms. Mason and Sanchez. <laughs> so I would say, and I'm going to say this in simple words, just we have to get real with things. Um, we have to see what's really out there, what the issues are. You know, sometimes like things can sound too pretty to be real, but we have to get out there and see what the actual needs of our communities are, you know, and also know that we have the power to do simple things to improve health um, in our communities, helping people, encouraging people that to believe in themselves. Um, in my case, working with youth, um, it was so inspiring to see them, how they confidently spoke to the USDA representatives. Like they, were, they were not hesitating because they knew that their issues from their communities were real. So, and that's why, and also having the opportunity to guide them through the, through the process of telling them like, you have, you have the knowledge and you bring this and they want to hear from you. And at the end of the presentation, we, 
we gather the research and everything. But at the end of the day, the representative asks, what's your perspective? What what's your experience of living in your community? And that's what we need to do. We need to hear from the people, like, what do you need? What, what's something that you don't think is being heard? What is something that you think we can improve? And having the USDA and this proposal of Plan for Better Health is a outlet or a resource for people to speak up into the issues. But at the end of the day, my, what I was thinking is like, let's get real with the situations that are happening in our communities and understanding that even if you're not working with the USDA, you have the power to, how can I use your, how can you use your resources to help people? But I think that's my takeaway from this experience. Well, I love that. So I have one more question, then we're going to open the floor up for Q&A. And so I hope everyone has their questions prepared. You know, we talked about what we read in the report and we've now launched the first pilot nutrition hub. So congratulations, Mr. Mm -hmm. McDonald, you all are up <laughs> first. So this be our test case. You know, if, if we think about it, what are some of the next steps that you would think would be important for something like a nutrition hub and working with our communities and in their pursuit? Because we <laughs> talked about, okay, we got the information, now what? Mm. And so I, I'm going to start with you, Ms. Vila. Are you, you, I'm going to give you a break, Mr. McDonald. I'm coming back to you. <laughs> Ms. Vila, talk about, so what, what are the important next steps for the nutrition hub? Well, I believe that um, developing a partnership with uh, the IHA and TAMIU and specifically the nursing program or my students, and we can obviously add the other ones, but first mine. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, creating a partnership to where we use this data and definitely looking for resources and funding to be able to uh, disseminate the help that is needed, um, as well as to continue to research and see what else that we could do for our community and that would you know foster both our community needs also as you know um, getting the students ready for 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 their field and as they want to advance in education you know when you go for your master's you need your you know your research of course and having having them prepared beforehand so I believe that um, we also need to honor those attendees of the uh, of the listening sessions by sharing these results back to them. Yep. And yes, the reports are beautiful and inclusive and they have this pie charts and all this data. But if I show that to them, they're going to have question marks on their faces. So having also a partnership to get those reports, uh, personally, uh, I can help to translate and because it's Spanish, 90% Spanish speaking community. And so I believe that there is a lot of things that we can do together and to use this data and use these listening sessions to, to improve uh, nutrition and health and make sure that we uh, go towards, you know, facing that food insecurity that, they, that there is. Uh, it's a big issue down in the community. I love that. And I'm excited about all those students who are going to go out working in nursing and working in health Definitely. and have this great understanding of the role of food and nutrition. Definitely. So. And also we'll give them opportunity, one for research, and um, if we can implement some sort of program, they could use that program to have their clinical, you know, their clinical hours and we'll be helping, you know, the community. So like that would be, uh, it's, I love it. I see it down. I see it down the path. Awesome. Mr. Harper. I think this is kind of a given, um, but I feel like for any project, you need to do a lot of internal capacity building, especially in those communities and partnering with community organizations. So like um, different tribal organizations and those are already there who have the trust and who have the know-how and framework, um, at least who know their community. I feel like that's kind of first and foremost. Then after that, I think specifically in tribal communities, it really is that cultural revitalization. I think that's how you can motivate people to attend or even go to like a center. It's how you can motivate people to look at, I guess, the knowledge and try to try their best to be involved and understand. I think um, like I, I, I know that would be a great motivational factor. Um, and then from there, I think it's just making sure that you're keeping the, your partners at the table, ensuring that everybody's at the same place in the pipeline, and really just kind of taking in, I guess, like, um, how do I say this, like, 
continuing to do the research. So kind of like this report's good, but maybe like after you start doing this progress, check in maybe about a year again, and then another year, see if anything's changed and if there's any new needs that need to be addressed, or if there's the same needs still need to be addressed. I think that's kind of one of the things I would recommend. Okay, great. I love that. Ms. Masonette Sanchez? I think it's very important for engaged people, to keep people engaged, because um, at the end of the day, you need from the people outside to make a progress and to change a community and a country. So it's very important. And from the youth perspective, um, when I left, when we ended the presentation, they were all engaged in the topic and they all wanted to give back to their communities. And I think it's based on giving them an experience. How can we um, put all the things that we want to do and give people an experience so they can implement and get influenced by this important topic in their day-to-day -day life? And how can, they, can that influence their decision-making? Also keep um, like educating people, understanding that there's uh, under this topic, the ascent of better health, there's a lot of things that we have to consider. Climate change, cultural, mental health, economics, and I think the four of us here are bringing the perspective of all those, those things. So it's very important for us to be here as we're doing this type of sessions to tell people like, hey, all of these things that we have to consider to make, to make this uh, moving forward, this is what we're doing. And more of this is important for it to be a real thing in our community and a real change. Absolutely, absolutely, Mr. McDonald. All right. Uh, so I definitely echo the sentiments of my panelists. Uh, I think overall we have to think of a as simple as a logic model. We have to know what our inputs are, the activities that will be done, the outputs, and then the expected outcomes. Uh, and after we have those four stages in place, we need to be able to evaluate to determine if it is a resourceful tool that can actually continue in implementation, or if there's areas of change that can be made adjusted or fitted properly so that it can then move into a better implementation phase. Uh, I think it comes in part from planning to implementation to evaluation altogether. Uh, again, I think EUSDA has done its part in making sure that the planning is done. The implementation is on us and the institutions, the organizations, the collaborations, the community input, and also uh, uh, stakeholders that we bring to the table. Uh, and then from there, as we together push this initiative through, we have to have the resourceful tools of evaluation. We have to know what works, what doesn't, what needs to be tweaked. Uh, because we know that we're not doing this just to check off another box. No. Mm -hmm. We're doing this to actually make change. Uh, and we don't do that again without everyone coming to the table, understanding their roles and actually having a solution, uh, some type of success at the end. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so the mic is now open for a question and answer. So if you have a question, please, you know, join us at the mic or would somebody pass the mic around to encourage questions. Um, and, and while we're getting the mic passed around and people are making their way to the microphone, I'll share that the community engagements, you know, initially it was designed for us to get the lived experiences and collect the data. But what we found out is that the engagements themselves were critically important. Because like we talked about, you start up in a room and everybody's quiet. And by the time we leave, everybody's talking to one another. They're engaging, they're helping one another. They're sharing some of their best practices. And then when we leave, we ask folks, what's one thing that you're going to take away from this room to somebody else? Mm -hmm. So wouldn't it be a shame if you heard all of this and you learned all this and you just kept it to yourself? Tell us one thing that you will share once you leave this room. And sometimes it seems that thing, you know, things have to be big and audacious, right? Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's just as simple as here's a, here's a wonderful substitution. Mm -hmm. Here's how you read the label. You know, and so um, so for all of us experts, you know, like you said, someone said it here, when you read this report, you'll find out some of the things are just quite low hanging fruit that could potentially change somebody's life, allow them to live to see their grandkids, mm -hmm. you know, to make small changes. And the good news is we put the toolkit on how to hold these community conversations on the ASEAN website. 
So if you want to hold them in your communities on whatever topic you choose to do, we hope you'll do it on this topic, but we have made those toolkits available for you to use. It's just been a wonderful way to just get the community engaged at the beginning. Okay, who's first with the question? All right, right here behind you, Deidre. Thanks a lot. I really appreciate it. There are so many issues going on in your communities and our communities, and I'm a nutritionist and I've been thinking about food my whole career, but I feel like there's so many voices in the room and food isn't, it doesn't always rise to the level of concern in community. And I'm just wondering your thoughts about that, how we can, it is so important for life. We know that and for health, but I sometimes feel like it's just a marginalized voice or issue because there's so much else that people are thinking about. What well, definitely, um, I think that the current lifestyle that that we are living it it's a barrier for a nutritious meal, but it, it's also the social media and lack of you know lack of of knowledge because you know the way culturally the way that we were brought up it's certain foods that are not that plate that needs to be completed with the sources that need to be in it. So I I believe that is just bringing awareness and particularly in my community continue to do events like this that will bring that awareness to the to to the people because um, otherwise it would stay the same because it's been passed on you know grandkids are being taken care of by the grandmother that only makes you know and our community tacos and tortillas and everything with vitamin T I would say which <laughs> you know um so you have the tortas the tacos the to everything it's, it's vitamin t so um i believe that it's just bringing you know awareness and uh, of what it what a nutritious meal it's contained and educate older generations so they can continue to bring it to you know to the newer generations because the meals uh for example the programs that we have for um, meals at schools they are nutritious and they have the complete circle, um, but do they eat all of it? Or are they are completing that nutritious meal? So I think it's a lot of just bringing uh, community engagement and bringing awareness to, you know, to what is it to be nutritious so that, that they continue that diet. Um, for me, I think to having a good lifestyle and a healthy lifestyle um, and better health regarding that, I think it's a balance of things. Um, we have, like I said right earlier, we have to be real about things. Not all the time we're gonna be able to eat the most healthiest food. And we have to see, and we have to be okay with that. Obviously we have to make a balance to an adjustments to try to eat the healthy food, to try to eat the nutrients that we need. But I feel like it all has to start with the relationship that we have with food. And that's where the mental health aspects comes in. We have to see food as a source of nutrients. We don't, we shouldn't, people shouldn't feel guilty about eating food or like, oh, I ate today a Kit Kat, I feel bad. You know, those foods are gonna be still in the stores. And if one day you decide to eat that, that's okay. That's it's about the relationship we build with food, and I think that's something that it's not quite as mentioned or as mentioned as often. Again, the Kit Kat is gonna be there. You shouldn't eat it every week or every day of the week, but if you have it once, you shouldn't be be feeling guilty about that. And I think that's an important thing to bring up to the food aspect, the mental health, and seeing food as the nutrients as a energy source other than something that we should feel guilty about and having that balance in our nutrition. Yeah, we, we shared about eating to live and not living to eat, right? And so a lot of us have had to question our relationship with food. And um, I know that is, it's, it's tough. It's a tough challenge. But when we make villain, villainous foods, you know, um, when I talked to the experts at USDA, they said, in moderation. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, it's in moderation because it, it's a every day. Try to do something a, a little different every day, every day, yeah. every day. And, oh, sorry. Go ahead. And we have like also, again, the social media and I'm bringing more of the, you know, youth perspective. We're very influenced by 
what we see in social media and the stereotypes that we have to follow. So I feel like those things bringing into, you know, the youth perspective I and mean, what we had in that session is very important. Again, I feel like food systems has, they're very related to mental health. And it's very important to encourage the youth and the people that food is our energy source. It's not something we should feel guilty about. It's not something that is a price. I've, I've heard people say, oh my God, I'm having this serve because I did this right. That's not, that's not okay. You know, no one should feel like food is like a price. It's an energy source and we are, and we should all be able to enjoy it. Having obviously that balance and nutrition aspect because we are not, we don't want to be unhealthy, but we should see it as an energy source and not something that we should feel guilty about. Thank you. We have time for one more question. Uh, hi, um, great presentation. So from a public health perspective, I am really happy to see that the community's voices are being heard. I'm happy to see that we're moving away from blaming the individual. It is the individual responsibility to eat healthy, stay healthy. And now we're focusing more on structural level factors that influence our behavior. But we also have to remember policy, right? Yes, we have a lot of competing other issues and we really don't have time sometimes to read those long labels of different things that we can not even pronounce on, on, on the labels of the foods. Um, so really holding the policymakers, who says the guidelines for how much salt could, should be on our, um, you know, products on our, on our foods, how much sugar, you know, who, who's telling Fritos, I like to eat Fritos here and there. They're so salty, mm -hmm. you know, like, who, so who, who is regulating that? Who is regulating our foods, you know, because then, yes, we have lack of access. I have access. I, I have a lot of stores. I live in California. I have a lot of access, but every time I walk in there, it's like, oh my God, like, like so much sugar, so much salt. I cannot read what, 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 what sort of ingredients are here. So we also have to remember policy. Like uh, we have, we're, com you're competing. You're, we Parents are competing with social media. You're competing with social media. We are competing with corporates, mm -hmm. corporates, you know, that, 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 that they, they, it seems like they get to say what's in, in, in our products, mm -hmm. but it shouldn't be like that. So, so, you know, thank you for your question. You know, the dietary guidelines, the, the, the DRIs, all of the guidance that we receive is science driven. So we have six nutrition centers internal to USDA. We have the land grant university who have, we're doing nutrition research, which is high tech research. Um, and that is what supports the guidelines that we put out. The reason why ascend is so important is because the guidelines in the past have really taken um, sort of an average approach. And we wanna be more precise about the, the, the nutritional guidance that we give to folks. And we need to teach folks how to read those labels so that the company is gonna produce their product and we have an opportunity to read those labels and make a choice about today, I'm gonna to have a Frito, to maybe tomorrow I won't, but I'm gonna do it as an informed consumer. And so that's gonna be critically important. And what it, I, we intentionally created this beautiful plate. This is not an accident that this plate is here on this, on this slide. You know, this is what your plate should look like, you know, um, lots of fruits and vegetables, you know, um, so we've got to get into the community and we've got to be able to help translate all of that science into information that people can use to make informed decisions, whether they decide to eat the Kit Kat or the Fritos, or they decide to buy a mango or a tomato, you know, they, they need to do it in an informed manner. And that's what we hope a sin will help people do. Um, unfortunately, we are out of time. I can't believe it. So panelists, I, I could talk to you guys all day and I'm sure that there are a lot of folks who still have questions for you. I hope you'll be able to hang around just a little bit, but thank you so much, not just for today, but for your ongoing engagement throughout this entire process and the work is not done. And so there's still much work to do to ensure that we're having the impact that's been intended with the SIN and the Nutrition Hub and our partnerships. And so I wanna thank you all. And if we could just give this panel a round of applause. And, and, and we want to thank you all for joining us today. And so please, you know, take, take as much time as you need here in the room and we'll just walk around for just a bit. So thank you so much.
To all of our colleagues online, thank you for joining us. That was not so fast.